Hello, welcome to uh, Psychiatry Grand Rounds. Um, today, April V. Rose Saidi, the team lead for the outpatient PTSD clinical treatment team and the evidence-based psychotherapy coordinator for the Boise VA will be doing a presentation for us. Thank you so much, Dr. Rose. Um, she sent me her bio. Let me just read that real quick. So Dr. Rose received her PsyD in clinical psychology with an emphasis in health psychology from George Fox University in Newburgh, Oregon in 2018. She completed a clinical internship with a focus on outpatient treatment of post-traumatic stress disorder at the Charlie Norwood VAMC in Augusta, Georgia. Her postdoctoral residency continued this focus on treatment of PTSD in both residential and outpatient settings at the Boise VAMC in Idaho. In 2020, she accepted a position at the Boise VAMC as a psychologist on both the outpatient PTSD clinical and substance use disorders treatment team. In spring of 2023, she took on the role of evidence-based psychotherapy coordinator and accepted role as team lead for the PCT in 2024. Her work is informed by third wave cognitive behavioral therapy, though much of her focus currently relates to the treatment of highly complex and dissociative patients. Dr. Rose is a trained provider of several evidence-based treatments for PTSD, including cognitive processing therapy, eye movement desensitization and reprocessing, prolonged exposure and written exposure therapies, and clinical hypnosis. And from a personal side, as a psychiatry resident, I love getting to share patients with Dr. Rose um, because she is always just such an excellent collaborator. So personally, thank you so much, Dr. Rose. I'm excited to hear uh, what you have for us today. Take it away. Thank you. Gosh, it's, it's so weird to hear somebody describe all of that stuff and know it's about me. That's just weird. Um, <clears throat> Anyway, so thank you very much for uh, inviting me. I appreciate it. Um, I'm excited to come and talk about complex trauma and dissociation uh, with you. And so let's do some housekeeping right off the bat. Um, just the uh, usual disclosures and disclaimers. I'm not affiliated with any other program. I work exclusively at the VA here. I don't have any conflicts of interest to disclose. Um, and while my work at the VA has inspired the training and information I'm sharing with you today, uh, the information and opinions I uh, am expressing are my own and are not the uh, opinions of the VA or the federal government. Um, so uh, let me give you a little bit of background um, and, and set the agenda for us. Um, the, National Center for PTSD uh, guidelines for um, uh, PTSD clinical teams, PCTs for short, um, suggests that PCTs should be responsible for providing treatment to patients of really some of the highest acuity level and greatest complexity within our system. And the reason for that is that PCT clinicians receive the most extensive training in evidence-based psychotherapies and treatment approaches. Um, and so the idea is that this, this population would benefit from um, that level of expertise. So what we're gonna talk about today is, um, I'm gonna start off with just a little bit of a, an overview of di and differentiation between post-traumatic stress as we understand it and complex post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, we'll, we'll go from there into uh, a discussion and overview of dissociative disorders and how that shows up. Um, I'll, uh, I'll walk you through what assessment options are available to help identify folks who might have a dissociative disorder. And we'll talk just a little bit about treatment options um, for people uh, who meet that criteria. Um, and then and then just, just a re real quick review. I'm gonna try and remember to pause periodically to uh, wet my whistle and give opportunities for questions. Also feel free to jump in and, and ask questions as well. Um, it's not meant to be a monologue, um, although it'll probably be a little bit of a monologue. Um, so without further ado, let's just jump in and get started. Um, everybody see the slides okay? Sweet, okay, cool. So let's talk a little bit about post-traumatic stress versus CPTSD. So first thing is there's no CPT CPTSD in the DSM, is there? Um, when we think of uh, 
of post-traumatic stress. So what we think of is this um, uh, criteria list that's on the left side, right? And that's the DSM-5 TR criteria list where criterion A involves a trauma exposure, um, and um, and then you're you're looking at um, uh, a cat four categories of symptoms, right? You've got intrusions, um, which are intrusions of memory, of imagery, of physical sensations or sensory information. Um, it could be intrusions of um, emotion. It could be uh, intrusion intrusions of thought um, or belief. Um, that show up unwanted um, in a person's mind, in a person's life who's encountered that, uh, that trauma event. Uh, the next category of symptoms is avoidance. And I think of avoidance in two sort of two camps, right? You've got avoidance, avoidance of the internal stuff, um, primarily all those intrusions I just mentioned. And then you've got avoidance of the external um, triggers. So anything that shows up in the environment that um, that, that traumatized individual ha um, um, has connected with the trauma event um, that then um, produces uh, the intrusive uh, responding. The third category of symptoms is, um, is really just negative thoughts and feelings. So this can be um, pervasive pervasive negative beliefs about oneself, about other people, about the world around them. Um, things like, um, it was my fault, um, I failed. Um, people cannot be trusted. The world is not a safe place, right? I'm guessing, um, show of hands, how many people have heard some of those things show up in clinical work? Yeah, no, nothing? Okay, thank you, thank you, there we go. <laughs> Um, and then, and then um, negative emotions, right? Ex um, intense um, experiences of um, fear, horror, anger, guilt, shame. Um, also an absence of positive emotions, um, inability to feel joy, um, to feel any sense of happiness or connection with um, the person's life or the person's loved ones. Um, loss of interest in um, doing things that they previously enjoyed. Um, a feeling of numbness and disconnection is really common and is also part of that category of symptoms. And then the last category is um, uh, involves the hyperarousal and reactivity symptoms. So this is where you're going to see the irritability and anger, right? That's the threat response getting triggered over and over again. Um, uh, sleep disturbance, either from intrusive nightmares or from racing thoughts or from that um, overactivated nervous system um, and, and um, physiological hyperarousal. Um, it's like having an adrenaline drip that's going all, all the time. Um, uh, difficulties with focus and concentration. Sometimes you'll see um, people who will engage in um, risky behaviors and that really ties into the negative cognitions and emotions and the absence of any kind of feeling, right? Doing something to try and get some sort of emotional response. Um, so that's the, the fourth category of symptoms um, in the hyperarousal and reactivity zone. And then of course, um, the symptoms have been pre present for greater than a month. They cause clinically significant distress and we can't blame them on anything else, right? So then when we look at the difference between that and complex PTSD, what we're seeing, first of all, is yes, everything we just talked about is present. And you're seeing problems in affect regulation, difficulty with um, um, extremely negative core beliefs, right? Um, feeling completely uh, valueless or worthless, um, feeling hopeless or diminished or defeated. Um, also intense feelings of shame and guilt specifically related to the trauma exposure itself. Um, feelings that, um, that the reason why that happened to that person was their own fault. Um, also difficulty with sustaining relationships and feeling close. Um, one of the core features of, um, of complex trauma is uh, difficulties with trust. Um, and so 
in order for you to be able to have a close relationship with someone, you do have to uh, experience some vulnerability and um, people with com complex trauma and complex post-traumatic stress um, have a very difficult time with that vulnerability and trust. And then we see significant impairment across all life domains. Um, so some, some important things to understand, um, prevalence of post-traumatic stress in the general population is about 3.4%. That's right out of the DSM. Um, prevalence of complex post-traumatic stress disorder is actually about 3.8%. So it's actually more common, uh, more prevalent um, in the general population than simple or straightforward PTSD. There are higher rates of both PTSD and complex PTSD in women than in men. Um, and cumulative childhood trauma, trauma that continues over, uh, over a time frame, is more strongly correlated with complex post-traumatic stress than it is with simple, straightforward post-traumatic stress. Let me pause there, see if there are any questions. No? Keep going? Okay. So let's talk a little bit about the differences in trauma exposure, right? In simple, straightforward post-traumatic stress, um, the, the trauma exposure falls into that, um, that criterion A category of directly experiencing, witnessing, or learning about um, a trauma event as it happened to a close friend or family member. And if that's the case, then it was violent or accidental. Um, experiencing um, exposure to actual or threatened death or serious injury or sexual violence. Um, or in some cases, repeated exposure to the aversive details of trauma events. And that was something that was actually added into the DSM-5 um, in response to specific trauma exposures having to do with, um, say, remote drone operation, um, or of course, our, our first responders um, who have repeated exposure to certain types of, uh, of trauma um, incidences. Complex post-traumatic stress um, may uh, occur following exposure to a more um, uh, threatening or horrific uh, event, um, and it's, it's most commonly something that occurs in a prolonged way or repetitive um, or over a time frame versus um, a singular event with a discrete beginning and end point. Um, of particular note is that um, the events that typically result in complex trauma often have um, a sort of an inescapability feel to them. Um, some examples of things that would result in, that may result in complex post-traumatic stress disorder would be um, things like um, torture or enslavement, um, genocide campaigns, um, prolonged domestic violence situations, and of course, repeated childhood sexual and or physical abuse as well. So there are some nuances to trauma exposure. And of course, it's different for each person. Um, whether somebody in, encounters something as traumatic has everything to do with um, how they were able to or not able to respond to the situation, um, their own sense of self-efficacy and mastery. Um, I had, uh, I worked with a patient one time um, who came in and as we were exploring what types of things we might be working on, I asked um, kind of a general question um, to get at the heart of things without leading. Um, and, and the question usually goes something like, you know, tell me about um, some of the most painful experiences you've had in your life. And, and this patient said, well, probably the, the worst thing I ever experienced was bullying when I was in grade school. And I said, okay. Um, and in my head, I'm thinking, okay, grade school. So, so that's a particular developmental stage. And I asked him, I said, you know, what was, tell me what was going on, what happened? And he said, well, every day I, I got up and I went to school and, um, and I got beat up. Um, and I said, okay, and, and what did you think to yourself every morning when you got up? And he said, well, I thought, every day I thought, um, today's the day I might die, right? And, and so 
you might say, well, bullying doesn't really qualify as a criterion A, but in that developmental stage, that child didn't know that it was really unlikely that they were going to go so far as to end his life, right? That seven-year-old, eight-year-old, nine-year-old child doesn't know that, doesn't have that perspective. So in that particular case, that is a criterion A because he thought that he his, his life was threatened. Um, <clears throat> attachment trauma um, is a really interesting um, um, sort of a double bind. Um, if you think about the infant or the small child's reliance for survival upon a caregiver who is also the source of the threat to survival, right? This creates a double bind. And this is one of the situations that is most commonly associated with the development of dissociative disorders because the child has to reconcile something that is irreconcilable. Um, intimate partner violence um, for a child witnessing violence toward his or her caregiver um, and that caregiver is responsible for that child's survival, that's a threat to the child's survival. Um, um, even neglect, right? A, a very young child does not have the perspective when they are hungry and there's no caregiver responding to that hunger, that child doesn't know that they will ever be fed again, right? So again, threat to survival. Um, so when I think about trauma exposure now, I think about how it relates to that perceived threat to survival, taking the developmental stage into context. Questions about that? Thoughts? Makes sense. Okay, keep going. <clears throat> so, Speaking of development, um, one of the things that I've learned um, over the course of, of some really intensive training I've done over the last 12 to 18 months about this um, is that survivors of um, prolonged child abuse often display some major limitations in areas of adaptive adult functioning. And, and these limitations um, can often be attributed to the trauma exposure itself. And they persist well beyond the resolution of the trauma and even beyond the resolution of PTSD related symptoms. Um, if you think about all of the things that have to happen in a normal developmental trajectory in order for a child to grow into an adult who has the ability to navigate interpersonal relationships, the ability to self-regulate emotions, um, the brain that is focused on survival in childhood is not learning. And whether you're talking about post-traumatic stress or complex post-traumatic stress, I conceptualize it fundamentally as a failure of learning, right? It's where the parts of the brain that are responsible for learning, for curiosity, have shut down because they're worried about staying alive and that's all they're focused on. And if you think about the small child, it, you know, even um, in early infancy, what we know about the development of regulation is that it starts externally, right? The, um, the production of oxytocin happens between the child and the caregiver as the caregiver responds to the child's needs and the child's nervous system down regulates when that response happens until that child reaches a developmental stage where they can internalize that, reg that regulation and handle it on their own. When the brain is focused on survival, that nervous system never learns that self-regulation. And so how many people just show of hands have, have had an adult in front of them who clearly has not developed that self-regulation that you would learn, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And it's really hard to make sense of that because you're seeing a full grown adult in front of you, but really what you're getting is, is that child's inability um, to regulate. Um, and then of course, the, the pathways and the structures of the brain develop um, along these, um, these alternative threat assessment focused pathways. 
Um, it's really interesting when working with somebody who, who had to be acutely aware of the mood states and the threat level in their environment as children, you will, you will find that they um, have a, almost a superpower in the ability to recognize micro changes in the facial, ins, uh, facial expressions um, and the body language of the people in the room around them. Um, I, uh, um, I will refer to um, several times in these slides, a patient that I work with who has a, um, a diagnosis of dissociative identity disorder and, um, and he will remark on micro changes in my facial ex expressions before I even know my face has changed. Um, and, and we meet via telehealth, right? So he's even seeing it on a screen and he can tell the difference. And sometimes he picks things up before I'm even consciously aware of them. But for him, that was necessary in order to stay out of harm's way. And that's gonna be, that's a very consistent superpower with people who experienced trauma during the developmental stage. Um, let's see. So let's shift and talk a little bit now about dissociation. And I'm gonna kind of go back to that um, right side, left side, um, DSM versus ICD-11 um, approach, right? Again, the DSM um, sort of goes partway there, but doesn't completely capture the, um, the full picture, right? Um, in the DSM, we see uh, um, available diagnoses of dissociative identity disorder, um, dissociative amnesia, um, the depersonalization and derealization that we um, frequently see uh, coming alongside um, as a component of post-traumatic stress. Um, and unspecified or other specified, right? So really general categories. If we go into the ICD-11, we see much more specific descriptions of dissociative um, processes. So a dissociative neurological symptom disorder um, involves this motor, sensory, or cognitive symptoms showing up that imply an involuntary discontinuity um, excuse me, discontinuity in normal sensory or cognitive integration. And it can't really be explained by anything else. There's not a, a medical, um, um, there's not a medical explanation for it. Um, there's no sort of dementing process that's going on that might be interfering with cognitive integration. Um, um, there's not a medication that we can point to that would cause it. Um, dissociative amnesia, oftentimes comes alongside some of the other dissociative disorders. So um, dissociative amnesia will be a really important clue in history taking as to whether or not there might be a dissociative process going on. Several patients, um, and I'm chagrined to admit, even before I really had a good understanding of how dissociative uh, processes show up, um, I had several patients that I worked with who described um, a, an absence of really any ability to recall anything before a certain age, right? Like one patient who didn't recall anything before age 11. Another patient uh, who I work with um, um, who had some really severe uh, developmental trauma um, who, when I first asked him, you know, to tell me about um, like memories of his mom, it took him several minutes to come up with a memory. And then the only thing he could come up with was, uh, was a singular memory um, from a time when they were sitting at the table when he was about 11, then that was it. Um, <clears throat> so this dissociative amnesia can be a really important clue um, when, you're, uh, when you're doing the, the intake information and you're thinking about, um, about different diagnostic possibilities. Inability to re um, recall important autobiographical memories um, and, and really disorganized and inconsistent recall. Um, a trance disorder is, um, um, is basically um, sort of a marked alteration of consciousness, right? It's a loss of, of that customary sense of identity and, and grounding in the present moment. Um, it, it can be a very um, 
uh, very much a narrowing of awareness, but not replaced by a different um, self-state or different alter. Um, a possession trance disorder um, involves that same ma marked alteration of consciousness, um, but also involves um, the, the normal sense of identity being replaced by what feels like an external possessing identity or other. Um, dissociative identity disorder um, is an identity disruption. And, and we're going to talk a little bit more um, in a little bit more detail about that um, coming up. But um, um, DID involves um, two or more distinct personality self states that are also associated with discontinuities discont in the sense of self. Um, there may be an absence of a core sense of self. Um, and there's also a sense of loss of agency and executive control. There may be amnesia as well. Um, the patient I work with regularly with dissociative identity disorder um, has certain self states that when they show up and take executive control, the state that I normally work with um, clinically does not remember. So when that self state comes back in and takes over, we have an agreement that I review what I talked about with the other self state so that, so that there's um, more of a sense of continuity in the recall. Um, and then um, interestingly, I also see partial dissociative identity disorder um, where there, there are at least two self states, but there's one that does most of the, the primary sort of operating in daily life um, that handles all of the functions and responsibilities of daily life. And there's other self states that sort of intrude. Um, another example of this in, in my own clinical work um, is a patient whom I work with who has a self state that does most of the daily management she has a lot of difficulty with the emotion regulation piece, with the interpersonal um, um, uh, effectiveness piece as well. And many of the self states that she describes um, sort of do a lot of loud talking in the background and, um, and are all vying for um, um, to be the loudest. Um, Many of those self states are are often aversive. They may be uh, sort of internalized perpetrator self states, um, um, and be uh, particularly negative. Um, and then depersonalization and derealization that we see oftentimes um, both in more complex dissociative disorders as well as um, um, more simple post traumatic stress presentations. Um, and depersonalization and derealization, it can be thought of as depersonalization is the self feels unreal and depersonalization is the world feels unreal. Um, the patient with dissociative identity disorder I work with has a difficult time looking in the mirror because when he does, um, the, the image that he sees that comes back to him doesn't feel real because that's not how he sees himself internally. Um, and so it's very dis, uh, disorienting for him. Um, I'll pause again. Any questions, thoughts? Uh, we uh, got a question about, uh, can you describe a self state? Like what, what do you mean by that? Yeah. Um, actually, um, we're going to talk a little bit more about that, but basically, um, um, and there's a really good theory um, that uh, uh, that I'll share with you, and and you can go and kind of read more about it. Um, but we're going to talk about um, the theory of structural dissociation here in another slide or two. Um, but basically, um, a self state is a state of being that was developed in response, typically to um, a traumatic situation, right? So um, especially in early childhood, when a child does not have all of the skills and abilities necessary to respond effectively to trauma, um, that child will typically develop um, uh, one state 
that has the capacity to either hold or deal with traumatic experiences in some way or another? We'll talk a little bit more about that, um, but great question. Um, and and uh, if you're curious too, I can describe kind of what that feels like clinically when we, when we get there too. So let me start this slide off with a question because you can see these prevalence rates, right? Dissociative identity disorder is, is um, and this is right out of the ICD, uh, excuse me, the, the DSM. Um, it's, it's as common as major depressive disorder more common than schizophrenia, um, and, and it has similar um, prevalence rates to um, all three of the bipolar diagnoses combined. Um, if the prevalence rate for dissociative identity disorder is roughly the same as major de depressive disorder, why do you think we don't see more DID diagnoses? Uh, probably because of functional impairment. Yeah. Yeah. Other thoughts? Um, also the controversial nature of the diagnosis, I think prevents clinicians from diagnosing it. A hundred percent, absolutely. Yeah, as a matter of fact, um, I could do a whole other talk on the history of, um, of dissociative experiences, right? Starting way back with hysteria and working forward and, um, and the very political nature of acknowledging um, that the, um, the dissociative experiences that, um, that many clinicians were seeing you know, in the early part of the century um, were actually related to um, childhood abuse and sexual assault and how unwilling as a society we were to, um, to acknowledge that. Um, yeah, so there's definitely a very um, sort of political component to it, if you will. Um, <clears throat> but I think, it's, I think it's tremendously important just to even have that perspective of um, like, what's the likelihood that somebody coming in and telling me that they're hearing voices is schizophrenia, is some kind of psychotic process versus a dissociative process going on, right? And incorporating that into that diagnostic thought process. All right, so I mentioned the theory of structural dissociation, and this is actually, you can Google this. There's a website that's just rich with information. Um, and research um, and some amazing, amazing perspectives. But the theory of structural dissociation makes a, a sort of a basic assumption that infants start out with sort of a loose set of different ego states, right? And they're connected to their needs. So feeding and attachment and exploration and um, and, you know, um, stomach distress, you know, uh, fatigue, all of these different cell states are relatively simple and straightforward. And over time, across a normal developmental trajectory, these self states integrate into one singular perspective, right? A, a cohesive personality um, that has the, the, um, the self view of, I am hungry, I am tired, I need a hug, right? Um, and, and that usually we estimate occurs um, and sort of completes between ages six and nine. So developmental trauma is going to interrupt that integrative process. The ego states can't merge due to the conflicting nature of the needs, right? And primarily this goes back to that, that attachment double bind, right? You rely, the, the child, the infant is relying upon a caregiver who is supposed to be the protection from danger, but is instead the cause of it. Um, and so memories of trauma maintain separateness of states. So that's the answer to your question, right? Is, um, is these different traumatic experiences actually get held and encapsulated in these different states that then get reactivated by daily life. 
Um, and then the learned action pathways in the brain and in the nervous system um, are, um, are holding those states in separateness. Um, so, so when we think of the, um, the, the structural dissociation sort of levels, if you will, there's a primary structural um, level of dissociation where one part of the self or personality is responsible for holding traumatic memory, right? We might call this the emotional part. And that the, the job of that self-state or that part is to hold that memory away from the rest of the system so that the system can function in a mostly, um, mostly normal and adaptive way. Um, and, and then there's this apparently normal part, right? Or ANP, as far as the theory goes, that functions in daily life. Um, <clears throat> a secondary structural dissociation um, perspective might be multiple um, personality um, parts or self states that remain separate from the main personality structure. This is what that partial dissociative identity disorder is going to look like. Um, and then a tertiary structural dissociative um, organization is going to have many emotional parts that exist in the system holding different aspects of trauma with multiple apparently normal parts, some of whom have the job of functioning in daily life, some of whom have the job of managing the emotional parts and keeping them away from um, the other parts um, and, and helping the system to function in that way. It's a much less organized, less functional um, um, sort of a dissociative state. Okay. So now what questions do you have? How is that different than um, like the, oh, the parts that people do in parts work where a person who maybe does not have trauma has their parts dialoguing with each other so they can better understand themselves? Yeah. Um, uh, when I think about that languaging, I think about internal family systems, right? That, that sort of identifies um, these different self states that we have. Though we all have them, we still hold that singular cohesive sense of self, right? We know that, um, like, I know that when I have, um, um, you know, a, a a younger part that's that's a teenager that shows up and, and gets nervous about public presentations, right? I know she's part of me. She's not separate. And so it's different than the internal experience of someone with dissociative identity disorder or partial dissociative identity disorder, where their internal experiencing of those parts is that they are separate. Right, and it may actually be something of a discovery or an epiphany for them to discover that those parts actually are them. They are all them. They're all one person existing inside. And in fact, one of the things um, that can be very challenging with that population is that there will be parts that act out in a self-destructive manner, either through non-suicidal self-injury, through eating um, disordered behavior, um, through suicidal um, <clears throat> behaviors and activities, not understanding um, that, that they're harming the entire system, um, right? They're acting out a very singular perspective that, um, that is, is completely unintegrated. Um, whereas I think most of us, um, the vast majority of us can recognize that we have different states of being, that we have different parts of ourselves that hold different perspectives, right? Um, and, and can shift to those different self states to look at things from different points of view, but we never feel like not us. Does that answer the question, Dr. Z, a little bit? Yeah, so essentially you see them as the same thing, just integrated versus not integrated. It's the same psychological, like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and um, and I like 
I like a lot of the language in internal family systems too. Although I don't go as far, they have, um, IFS has very specific sort of designations for the internal parts, right? Theory of structural dissociation does too. The emotional parts, the apparently normal parts, these kinds of things. I don't actually go that far. I oftentimes wanna have that exploration, that sort of organic discovery process of the, the person's internal self-structure. And I want the patient to tell me what those parts are and what their function is, because it's a great discovery for them too. Most of the time they haven't really thought about it before. Um, and so I don't wanna label anything. I want that just to kind of unfold and for us to start building those relationships and learning to value those parts for exactly the jobs they do. <clears throat> Okay, let's see, blank slide. Um, okay, so how do PTSD, CPTSD and dissociation show up in our clinical work? Um, so there was, I, I saw a meta-analysis um, that, uh, that used a, a total of 520 patients, clinical patients over many, many different studies and 83% of those 520 patients with a, dis a confirmed diagnosis of DID reported those somatic symptoms. So lots and lots of, of headaches, migraines, um, unexplainable seizures, um, many chronic pain syndromes, um, fibromyalgia. Um, you're also gonna see lots of memory problems and that um, the lack of continuity in the recall or blank periods, right? Where they can't really access it. Um, I mentioned eating disorders, many, many varied self-harm self behaviors. Um, and the self-harm behaviors can be um, the, the sort of cry for help self-harm behaviors, they can also be a, um, a release of psychological tension, right? So it's really important to explore the function of the behaviors themselves. Wide ranging mood fluctuations. This is where it's sometimes it's really difficult um, to know whether you're looking at bipolar disorder, or whether you're looking at various self states showing up with extreme mood variations. And then of course, hearing voices, right? Um, and and those, um, those internal intrusions that show up. Um, so when we're thinking about differential diagnoses, um, some, of the, some of the diagnoses that I see that show up with dissociative disorders, most commonly are gonna be bipolar, or excuse me, bipolar disorder, um, borderline personality disorder, and um, the schizophrenia spectrum disorders. When I think of borderline, um, I think of kind of two distinct presentations, right? Or, or sort of more traditional borderline presentation where that individual is oriented around getting their needs met, right? And if you, if you look at the etiology of that behavior, it's coming from um, a childhood in which the, the the self, um, the, the personhood of the child was really invisible or absent, um, um, except in the context of meeting the caregiver's needs, right? And so that child continues into adulthood seeking to get those needs met and to be seen. Um, and then that second presentation um, is one in which the person is responding to the world around them as unsafe and untrustworthy. Um, and they're, they're attempting to do things to create a sense of stability um, and structure with a very chaotic internal organizational structure. And the second presentation is the one that I always think of as more cl closely tied to complex post-traumatic stress disorder. Intense mood variability, um, as I mentioned, can look like bipolar, but may instead be those different self states showing up. Um, and then again, um, also manifestations of um, that intense affect dysregulation is also um, the identified components of complex PTSD may again be different self states showing up. <clears throat> 
Um, <clears throat> so when we think about uh, um, schizophrenia versus DID, one of the things that's really interesting to pay attention to is that um, of the about, I think, 11 Schneiderian first rank symptoms in schizophrenia, eight of them are also present in dissociative identity disorder. So it is really difficult to parse this out. Um, one of the main differences might be that the hallucinations, the um, auditory and visual hallucinations in, diso in DID are gonna be more auto-hypnotic in nature, right? It has very much more an internal sort of a, a, a trance-like state to it or feel to it. Um, another thing, um, to pay attention to is uh, the time frame in which voices showed up, um, right? Oftentimes we see first onset of schizophrenia in the um, uh, late, late childhood, early adulthood, um, whereas DID voices have often been, been present since childhood. Um, and then the, the voices in DID are often communication between internal states and with that, uh, that maybe main personality um, that's showing up to therapy um, um, or the, the appointment um, and, and can have a lot of, of sort of chaotic background um, um, intrusions going on. Uh, one patient I have who um, would meet criteria for partial DID, um, she has a main part that shows up, that functions in daily life, shows up to therapy, and she has um, various self states that are oftentimes in the background communicating with each other and communicating with her. Um, and then also thinking about um, um, whether or not the symptoms that the patient is reporting are um, improved by antipsychotic medication. Sometimes the, the prescription can be diagnostic in and of itself um, because um, DID uh, Schneiderian symptoms often won't be affected by antipsychotic medication. Um, and, and also interesting to note that in the same way that, um, that schizophrenia has sort of these positive and negative um, symptom presentations, DID also parallels that in, in the positive and negative nature of the DID symptoms. So those, the positive DID symptoms are gonna be those intrusions, right? While the negative symptoms may represent the losses in function that cannot be explained, um, the losses of memory. Um, a great example of this is going back to the patient I work with who has um, dissociative identity disorder. He um, has identified um, two specific self-states uh, one of which speaks uh, fluent Spanish um, and the other of which plays the guitar. Um, and he shared a conversation he had with his wife um, about coming across the guitar, which is stored in the garage. He was cleaning the garage out and he asked his wife if he could get rid of it. And, 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 and she said, well, no, you might want to play it again. And, and he said, uh, why? Well, I, I don't know how to play the guitar because the part of him that operates mostly in daily um, uh, in daily life doesn't know how to play the guitar. <clears throat> any questions about any of that? That was a big download. No, good. Okay. Yes, Rania? Dr. Rose, sorry, I do have a question. Um, <laughs> um, you mentioned, let's see, I missed this little part about personhood and the, you know, self and was invisible except to caregivers needs. Tell me which one you were associating with that again. Yeah, so borderline personality disorder um, often is the diagnosis that, um, that we give to, to somebody who has that childhood experience of really being invisible um, and not, not having a caregiver who really sees and acknowledges that, that child as separate from um, serving the function of meeting their own needs. Yeah. Okay, that's what I thought. I just wanted to make sure, thank you. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Okay, I'm looking at the time. I'm gonna try and, uh, I'm gonna try and hit the ground uh, running so we can get to uh, maybe questions if you have any.
Um, so let's talk briefly about assessment. Um, assessment for dissociative disorders is like either really brief or really deep. And there doesn't seem to be a middle ground really. Um, there are some really good screeners. Um, I frequently will use the um, dissociative experiences scale two or DES two. It is, um, it is not a validated um, normed uh, screening tool. However, it has 28 questions that get right at the heart of dissociative processes. Um, there are three different categories uh, it assesses for amnesia, absorption and imagination, and depersonalization and derealization. And it has some different um, 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 endorsement percentages based on different diagnoses to kind of guide you. Um, it can be a really great um, diagnostic tool as sort of a clinical interview and give you some really good qualitative information about um, a patient's experiencing. Um, the DSS uh, is a 20 item self-report. Um, it's, a, it's a brief uh, sort of recent snapshot, covers most recent week uh, timeframe. It was originally research oriented um, in its person, uh, in its purpose, but um, um, is good at assessing the gaps between awareness and memory and distor distortions and perceptions and self surroundings um, um, will capture memory misperceptions along with cognitive and behavioral re-experiencing. Um, the DSPS is 15 items. It's got three subscales, um, derealization and depersonalization, loss of awareness, and psychogenic amnesia. And then we get into the sort of deeper dive options. Um, the TSI-2, I actually use on a regular basis. I really like it. It's normed and validated. Um, it's got three main scales. Um, it measures attachment, um, somatic preoccupation. It assesses for suicidality and how much that shows up. Um, there are some subscales that capture um, post-traumatic stress, externalization, somatization. Um, and then it's, uh, it's also got some validity scales um, to, uh, to kind of help you assess for overreporting. The mid is probably um, the biggest one is 218 items. It, uh, it produces a really beautiful report um, and it's a comprehensive assessment um, for the domain of pretty much all dissociative phenomena. Um, it generates scale scores and categorical diagnoses. It'll capture DID, um, PTSD, and bipolar, um, excuse me, not bipolar, um, borderline personality, and it incorporates validity scales. And then the, um, the SCID is basically kind of the gold standard for, um, for assessing and diagnosing um, dissociative disorders. Um, and uh, involves a semi-structured interview process. So that's gonna be your real deep dive um, into the, the dissociative assessment process with the patient. Um, treatment options um, have kind of two distinct trajectories, right? Simple post-traumatic stress in my experience is one of the most treatable mental health conditions and, and it responds very, very well to our evidence-based treatments. So cognitive processing therapy and prolonged exposure and written exposure and EMDR are very, very good at reducing the, the PTSD uh, symptomology that shows up. Complex PTSD requires a really a different and longer process where you're initially focused on the development of trust and rapport. You're um, um, broadly and comprehensively assessing um, safety um, and working on stabilization. There's a lot of uh, psychoeducation and resource building that goes on in phase one. Um, and then phase two is where you might actually use some of those evidence-based protocols, right? You might use um, clinical hypnosis or EMDR um, or cognitive processing therapy to actually be working through the traumatic material. You may have to bounce in and out of phase one um, in order to maintain stability. Um, and oftentimes you have to go in in sort of a layered approach, right? Peeling back the phobias of approaching traumatic material before you can actually work on the memories themselves. And then phase three um, is the integration phase where you're processing the loss of the experiences um, that 
should have happened and didn't happen during childhood. Um, you're maintaining the gains, you're integrating different self states and starting to see and feel the sense of self as a whole. Um, amazingly, the prognosis for treatment of patients with um, um, complex trauma and dissociative disorders is really, really good for um, patients who have the, the benefit of working with a provider who's uh, trained in this three-phase approach um, and evidence-based modalities for um, uh, complex trauma and PTSD, the recovery rate is actually greater than 93%, which is really cool. Um, so my takeaways. Complex PTSD is actually a little bit more common than simple PTSD. Um, and dissociative disorders are all around us. <laughs> um, and, and we may or may not even be aware of, of those processes happening um, because they can be a little bit difficult to pin down. Um, differential diagnosis is important and incorporating the possibility of a dissociative process um, can be tremendously valuable to that diagnostic process. There's lots of assess assessment options. They're widely available. Many of them are free. Um, and treatment is effective, right? If somebody, um, if a patient with complex trauma and post and, uh, and uh, dissociation um, is able to work with a clinician who's well-trained um, in that, um, they're likely to get better, which is, which is awesome. Um, so four minutes to go. Thank you very much. Questions? first question is how many people how much how what do we have here at the VA in terms of people trained to do to work in dissociation because uh I when I'm talking to my patients who have dissociation about treatment uh I do have a hard time knowing what to tell them is going to happen how likely it is they're going to get better especially if they've already done PTSD treatment yeah what's different from PTSD treatment that they've done before to what's going to happen now. And also not sure if like they're going to get funneled towards someone who can sort of go with how this disassociation is affecting their life. Yeah. Gosh. And that's such a good question. It always comes back to resources here. Um, so right now in our facility, um, the providers on my team are, mainly the resource for this treatment. Um, I think it's possible that Dr. Waters in the TRC may have some experience with it as well. I would have to follow up with, uh, with her on that to confirm. Um, but, um, but I know that, that uh, she's been an EMDR provider for more than a decade and, and has done a lot of, of work um, deepening that skill. Um, so I'd be surprised if she didn't have some experience with it. And that's probably about it that I'm aware of. Yeah. And when I tell them what's different than the PTSD treatment they've done before, um, do, do I just kind of say it's like a longer course or more modalities are integrated? Like, how do I kind of describe? Because they're when we talk about it, they are usually like, okay, what's next? What do I do about it? Yeah. Um, you know, full disclosure, I'm still learning about um, everything that has to do with treatment for this population. And I'd love to say, here's the protocol, right? But what I can tell you is that it's going to be different for each patient. Um, the patient I work with who has, dis uh, who has DID, um, he and I have been wor working together for, I don't know, 10, 11 months now. Um, we're still very much in phase one. He's just started to trust me. Um, and, um, and, and we're just starting to think about maybe approaching some traumatic material. Um, so what I, can, what I can say is that it will be a process that more specifically focuses on where their, their, their individual deficits might be um, and how, how to rebuild those um, those deficits that they didn't learn in childhood and need to learn in adulthood in order to improve their functioning. 
Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. Dr. Rose, thank you so much for this information. It was so helpful. I feel like I see disassociative conditions um, often in SED. Um, I wanted to ask you, as far as digging deeper, because um, you spoke to something that I have felt sort of intuitively was happening and that there's many you know, varying levels of this. And so if I wanna dig deeper, is there a book that you recommend that would help me with that area specifically? Yeah, I, yes, I can recommend lots of great, great reading materials. Um, yeah, lots of stuff that's come out of my training um, that we actually have uh, in the library here now. So oh, great. Um, our library right. has Thank a much you. more robust presentation of, of materials for this than it used to. Yeah. Um, I can, and I can stay. Um, Dr. Goss, I feel like you had a question. <laughs> I did. Thank you so much for this really thought provoking presentation. Um, I was, I'm just wondering from the forensic side, there's been a long standing dialogue about how to evaluate and manage these diagnoses, especially DID, um, when it comes to the question of criminal responsibility. Um, and I, I just wondered if you had any thoughts um, about uh, that question um, and and specifically how courts could um, could think about uh, whether a patient who um, is presenting with symptoms of DID uh, could be held responsible or not for criminal behavior. You know, I don't know that I could. I mean, forensic work is so is well out of out of my scope of expertise. I don't know that I could speak intelligently to the nuances of that, but it has been a longstanding um, um, sort of uh, disagreement argument, right? Um, and I think also um, one of the things that that I see commonly in my lived experience, my clinical work is that people who have, who genuinely do have dissociative identity disorder, probably not gonna tell you. It's very rarely flagrant. Um, and, um, and most of the time they're working very much on trying to appear normal. That makes sense. Thank you for that. Yeah, yeah. I know we're I, we're two minutes over. Anybody have any final questions? From the group, anything? Uh, thank, you. thank you, thank you. Yeah, feel free to reach out. Um, don't hesitate to reach out if you have questions. I'm happy to share materials and and case conceptualization and discussion and all of that. So, yeah. Super. Thank Thanks you so much. So much. Bye. Bye.